Hi, I'm Dr. Richard Terry, the Dean of the Lee Comet Elmira Medical School. You know, we have opportunity to interview thousands of students each year for admission to medical school. And I've heard just about every story, but I want an opportunity to talk to you about the five most common myths about applying to med school. You know, first of all, one of the things that I often will read, particularly about our new campus here at Elmira, well, it's a new school with a new curriculum. Be careful about applying. They may not have everything tested. Well, the curriculum here is a problem-based learning curriculum, one that's been in place at our other campuses for nearly 22 years. It's well tested, well proven, and the outcomes are excellent. Number two, well, if I'm an osteopathic graduate, maybe I won't have the same opportunities for residency. Now, that simply isn't true. At LECOM, we have an extensive array of residency programs, ranging from family medicine, internal medicine, to orthopedics, to dermatology, to anesthesia, to diagnostic radiology, to any competitive specialty you, you may want, we have. And as an osteopathic graduate of LECOM, you're not disadvantaged in any way, shape, or form to get a competitive residency because our network of hospitals is vast and they're affiliated with us and our students are well prepared. Myth number three, I'm an osteopathic graduate. I must take USMLE to be competitive. Well, that's simply not true. USMLE, step one, and level one are now completely equivalent. Every single study has shown that. Yet, online, students will say, you better take that. Well, to me, it doesn't make much sense to take two pass-fail exams. It's extra expense for you, extra anxiety, and studying for one or the other simultaneously may jeopardize your chances of doing well. We prepare you well to pass complex level one. And as an osteopath, practicing osteopathic physician, practicing now for 30 years, certainly that will serve you just fine. It's a minimum competency exam, and there should be no concern that you should have to take both exams. That's a lie. It's not true. Numerous, numerous studies have shown equivalence on level one and level two. Number four, myths about what you might see online. That basically, it doesn't matter. Schools that don't have an attendance policy, or if you don't have to go to class, and you can do anatomy completely asynchronously at home, that somehow that would in some way be advantageous to being in school. That's not true. We know that we lose something by not interacting together. Here at LECOM, we do have an attendance policy. We want you to come to class. You're becoming doctors. The most critical skill you can learn as a physician is not only to be competent, but to be communicate effectively. We teach you that within our various settings, in our problem-based learning curriculum, and in our other settings and our other curricular pathways as well. So it is advantageous to come to class. Uh, that is the expectation. Doing your first two years completely remotely uh, is not going to prepare you well for engagement in the clinical setting when you're expected to be there. Sometimes as early as 4.30 a.m. maybe for a surgical rotation. So we prepare you well for engagement in the clinical setting. And I think the idea that we could somehow do the first two years of med school remotely and none of that would matter, well, that's simply not true. The engagement you have with your peers, learning those critical humanistic skills matters. And that begins day one at LACOM, where you're working as a team be it anatomy, be it OPP, or be it in your problem-based learning curriculum. So I would dispel that belief that not going to class is, is not critical. It certainly is. Learning that professionalism early on will make you a more competitive applicant, a better resident, and ultimately a better attending physician who's more apt to be successful. Most of, unfortunately, what we read online simply is simply not, not true. You know, these, these, all these falsehoods are kind of spread out there. So, myth number five. Somehow, I can glean more information if I just go online than I go to one of my professors, or, in this case, the dean of the medical school, to actually get any advice on residency education, boards, 
etc., etc. Somehow, Reddit seems to be the source of information for many. Well, unfortunately, most of what's on there is simply not true. And I think sometimes it leads students to think, well, peers have written this, so it must be so. The reality is, it isn't. And I would say that would be the last place in the world I would go for any credible information. Look, you're all going to be physicians. Let's look at the facts. And the facts are we can look at hard data, hard data on what board scores basically drive success in residency. A strong board score, in this case a part two, level, level two board score will drive success for any competitive residency program. I would suggest we look at the hard data, advice from your regional dean, career counselor and such on residency placement and not go to online people and say you've got to do this, this, this and this. Another common myth as part of this is the idea that, well, I must do auditions everywhere known to humankind in order to place. Well, that isn't always true. In fact, most residencies do not value auditions significantly. A few do, some do, some smaller specialties for the most, but for the most part, they're not nearly as valuable and as much credence as we sometimes give them. What really matters for competitive residency placement, be it in family medicine, orthopedics, is one, a strong academic performance. And if you're going for a very competitive specialty like Durham, it's going to have to be a very strong GPA, and it's going to be, have to be very high board scores. It's as simple as that. Other specialties are not quite as competitive, and the reason is there just are many more spots available in family medicine or internal medicine. So to get a competitive specialty, ortho, Durham, general surgery, ENT, ophthalmology, here's what you need to have. One, a great board score. You can't have a fail on anything. Two, a very strong GPA, and you certainly want to be in the upper quartile, first quartile of your class. It's as simple as that. Number three, outstanding clinical evaluations on your rotations. Number four, some research. How much? One, two, three projects. Number five, some element of community service in some kind of level. And um, number four, be realistic apply to places where you realistically can get in that may have had other LECOM graduates before uh, or have taken osteopathic positions. I'm not saying not apply to REACH programs. Of course we should, but we should always have some other places that we have a better chance and are more successful and, and a track, rate of, track record of success. But bottom line, in a general sense, most of what's online is untrue, but just untrue. You should check out the facts and go to NRMP, other places that actually have the raw data that show you the success of osteopathic graduates in various specialties. And I think for the most part, you'll be very surprised that we're generally pretty well represented. And really, it's more about academic performance, board scores, than it is necessarily about your pedigree. Not in all cases, but in most cases. The field is getting level. Not exactly where it potentially could be, but a whole lot better than it was 30 years ago when I applied for residency and most of the options for osteopathic graduates were family medicine, frankly. In fact, half of my class of about 100 at NICOM at the time went into family medicine because those were the opportunities. Now you have a vast array of opportunities in just about every specialty. And LECOM, with its robust clinical education, and exposures in affiliates literally all over the country gives you the chance to match into competitive specialties. Be it ophthalmology to radiology, you have that option here.